Okay, welcome to the last uh, session. Um, we have the pleasure of having here David uh, Rappa from the Atlanta Fed, and the discussion will be Michel van der Bell. Okay. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, okay. Yes. Thank you. I very much enjoyed the the conference. Of course, it's been uh, it's been wonderful. It's an honor to be here. It's an especial honor when I realize uh, I just learned that it's uh, official ECB conference policy for the best paper to go last. So, uh, yeah, I'm, I, again, I'm more uh, I'm deeply honored. So, thank you for that. Um, okay, so this is joint work with a number of people from Arhus, including uh, let's see, uh, Daniel Bora, Christian Monteshuta, and Sander. Shwank Nebe and then Philip Goulet Coulomb from uh, UCLOM. Uh, the usual dis uh, disclaimer, of course. So, stating the obvious here, uh, you know, these days, large data sets and machine learning, right there, trending. We're, we're all doing it. Uh, they're growing in importance in macroeconomics and finance when it comes to out of sample time series forecasting, as we've seen in a number of applications, of course, at this very conference. Large data sets provide greater capacity, right, to incorporate relevant signals. So if I want to forecast a particular variable, the larger my data set, all else equal, you know, the greater chance that I'll find relevant signals. Uh, machine learning. Well, if I have a large data set, right, I'm going to be keenly worried about overfitting if I use conventional techniques. And of course, machine learning provides numerous tools to guard against to guard against overfitting. And this, of course, will help to improve out of sample performance with many predictors. Machine learning can also accommodate general nonlinearities. So if we think nonlinearities, nonlinearities are an important component of the data generating process, then uh, a number of machine learning tools are quite helpful. Again, we've seen these uh, at work here at this conference. Familiar examples, random forest, boosted trees, neural networks. Some recent examples and macro forecasting, right? And again, this is just a partial list. Might be a few people here, uh, but again, applications with inflation forecasting, output employment growth, unemployment rate, initial claims, recession. Uh, let's see, I think uh, Kleiber might be here, maybe, yeah, I think Ray Patch is here. Uh, financial forecasting as well, uh, it's becoming quite popular in finance, especially in with respect to stock returns, uh, both uh, at the aggregate level and at the individual stock level, and in other aspects too, I think, uh, I think Danielle Bianche, right? Uh, on returns, yeah, with machine learning. So again, uh, this is this literature is constantly growing. In addition to out of sample forecasting accuracy, the interpretation of these fitted prediction models is important, uh, even crucial. So just such basic questions as you know, which predictors are the most relevant for determining the forecast generated by some fitted machine learning model? And actually, at the heart of this paper, how do the predictors contrib contribute to out-of-sample forecasting accuracy? Interpretation helps users to, to wrap their minds, if you like, right, around forecasting models so they're not so-called black boxes, right? That's kind of a standard criticism of machine learning methods, right? You know, what the heck's going on? It's just a black box. Uh, you know, from an economic standpoint, a theoretical standpoint, gaining insight into empirically important economic mechanisms in our forecasting models by interpreting them can help to guide the assessment and development of theories. And uh, as a recent, someone who recently joined uh, the Federal Reserve System, yeah, you know, understanding these forecasting models helps us to provide more comprehensible advice to policymakers, right? I don't think you want to say, 
Well, you know, Mr. President of Central Bank, uh, it's what my black box model says, so no worries. Uh, of course, there are a variety of existing model agnostic tools for interpreting for interpreting fitted models. I'm sure many of you are familiar with these. Uh, primarily along two dimensions. So if you want to examine how um, the, the predictions or the forecasts made by a model vary with an individual predictor or perhaps a couple predictors, if you want to go into two dimensions, this is there are a number of tools for this. You may be familiar with so-called partial dependence plots, Shapley values. We'll lean heavily on Shapley values uh, tonight or this afternoon, whatever. Uh, ice plots, limes, ales. So again, this is when we want to study how a model's prediction varies with a predictor. Variable Im or feature importance also receives a lot of attention, right? So just measuring you know, how important is a given predictor in your fitted model? How important is it for generating forecast in your model? And so we have PDP-based measures, permutation uh, that can be used to measure feature variable or feature importance, as well as Shapley-based measures. Now, existing tools are more appropriate for cross-sectional data for reasons that I'll describe in more detail as we get proceed. What we do in this paper is we focus on developing Shapley-based metrics for time series data. And so we'll develop basically three metrics. Actually, we have a fourth that we're going to add that uh, I might be able to talk about, time permitting. But if it's the last session, I could go on for... Yeah, yeah, let's, okay, yeah, let's do it, okay. Um, so we're going to develop uh, what we call I Shapley VI and O Shapley VI. So this is the, this is an in-sample Shapley variable importance measure designed for time series data. You're estimating a sequence of forecasting models to forecast time series data. We'll develop an out-of-sample Shapley variable importance measure, O Shapley VI, and then our main methodological contribution is what we call the performance-based Shapley value. And it's going to measure the contributions of individual predictors to the out-of-sample forecasting accuracy of your actually sequence of fitted models that you use to generate a sequence of time series forecasts of, say, a macro variable or, uh, say, an asset return, what have you. And it's going to identify the predictors most responsible for a model's out-of-sample performance. And in this way, it's going to allow us to basically decompose the model's loss function. So we can look overall, what's the what's your uh, RMSE for your model? We'll be able to decompose that RMSE into the contributions of each of the predictors. And in this sense, we anatomize out-of-sample forecasting accuracy Hence the catchy title, if I do say so myself. Uh, PBSV applies to any fitted prediction model. It can be linear, nonlinear. It can be parametric, non-parametric. Just need like a predict function. Uh, it applies to any loss function. We're going to have an empirical application. We'll forecast U.S. inflation. Uh, we'll come to that in a moment. I'm going to have to move at, uh, at light speed here. Okay, so I'm going to have to skip over a lot of details. Uh, if you have questions about the details, you know, please reach out to me afterward uh, via email, whatever. We can have Zoom calls. Uh, but let me just try to set up some notation in our time series context. So we're going to index individual predictors that you're using in your model by P. And so cap S will be the index set of predictors going from 1 to cap P. We'll collect the period T vector of predictors, okay, and... The, uh, the vector xt. Here's the prediction model. Our target will be some you know, cumulative growth rate or cumulative return. And then we're going to have f of xt. This is our the conditional mean or the prediction function. And then we're going to have an additive error term, right? And so this is our 
this is our target, right? We want to, so we want to fit this. We want to estimate FT to make forecasts. When we, uh, yeah, so we want to define the the training sample or the the estimation window that we use when we fit a training model. So for a given model I, WI will just be the set of time series observations used to fit a particular model, your training sample or your estimation window. And then your fitted prediction model in this time series context will be F hat. You're gonna evaluate it at instance XT, so you plug in XT in your model. And then we have WI reminding us that you fitted the model using the training sample, the window WI, and then H is the forecast horizon. We interpret, as I mentioned before, fitted prediction models with Shapley values. So Shapley values essentially exploit the analogy between predictors and players in a cooperative game earning payoffs. And in the context of making forecasts, the payoff is a predictor's contribution to a model's prediction. So you can imagine a predictor's kind of, they're, they're playing a cooperative game, and the payoff to each predictor will be, again, its contribution to the model's prediction. And so we can think of Shapley values as fairly allocating the predictor's contributions to the prediction. Shapley values have some nice properties. I don't have time to go into details on those, but in general, I think it's safe to say if you consult a number of textbooks on you know, uh, interpretable machine learning, Shapley values seem to be the preferred uh, metric. Uh, so this, there's a, there are a couple of nice papers by Strumbel and Kononenko, and they use Shapley values to interpret prediction models. So Shapley values were, you know, Shapley invented Shapley values way back in the day, 53, I think. And so then uh, for, you know, game theory, and then again, Strumbel and Kononenko apply Shapley values to interpret prediction models. And so we're basically going to modify their approach for time series prediction. And so the aim of a Shapley value in a time series context is to, we want to quantify the marginal contribution of this of predictor P, right, to this prediction or forecast, F hat, XT, window, WI, horizon H, conditional on the presence of all the other predictors. So all the predictors are in cap S, and this is set minus P, okay? So we just want to measure the contribution of predictor P to the prediction. That's actually a, a, a tricky issue, right? It's, it's, it's trivial almost in a linear model, right? Okay, because there, there are no interaction terms. But if you have interaction terms, nonlinearities, what have you, then to try to decide, well, exactly what was the marginal contribution of predictor XP, right, that's quite tricky. And so Shapley values, the logic of Shapley values is going to allocate the contributions of each predictor to the prediction fairly if you buy the logic of, again, Shapley values. Uh, this is the formal definition of the Shapley value for predictor P. Uh, for instance, XT, and again, I'm just emphasizing here, this is for a model fitted with window WI and horizon H. So again, there's so much notation to go through here and we could spend uh, again an hour just making sure we have a good handle on, uh, on Shapley values. But basically what's going on is you're gonna form, a, you're just gonna select a coalition denoted by cat Q of predictors. Suppose I predict, uh, I select predictors one and two and I wanna measure the contribution of predictor three to the final prediction. Well, what I would do is I'd say, okay, what is, uh, I condition on predictors one, two, and three. That's this value function here. And then I subtract the prediction made by my fitted model, just conditioning on one and two, right? The two predictors in this coalition. And I get that difference. Well, do this for all possible coalitions that exclude P, and then take a weighted average of that, okay? That's how you measure the Shapley value, okay?
Okay, so it's using these coalitions, right, to control for the effects of all the other predictors, and you're looking at this difference in the value function. Uh, yes, in the interest of time, right. Uh, again, a nice property of Shapley values is so-called efficiency, aka local accuracy. So if you have a given instance, a given XT, you plug it into your prediction model, it gives you a prediction of, say, 3%. Uh, you can basically take the Shapley values for each of your predictors, add them together, you get 3%. Okay, so they perfectly add up. Okay, that's a suggestion, right? Yeah, good, okay, thanks. I respectfully uh, accept your suggestion of 10 minutes. Okay. Um, there are other nice properties, missingness, uh, symmetry, linearity. Again, we won't go into the details. Uh, now, it's the formula that we saw before, where you form all possible coalitions that exclude predictor P to compute the Shapley value. That's infeasible to do in practice. So we need to use some sort of algorithm. And uh, again, Strumble and Kononenko develop an, a nice algorithm for estimating Shapley values. We use a refined version of it. Uh, again, can't, don't have time to go into the details, but we can rewrite the definition of a Shapley value in this manner. And then we can basically come up with an algorithm where we're gonna make a, a random draw of an ordered permutation of the predictors and if we make a reasonable number of draws, we can approximate quite well, quite accurately, the Shapley value corresponding to a given predictor. And again, this is the, the all the details. Um, again, I'm gonna move quickly in the interest of time for, for the algorithm that we use to estimate the Shapley value, the efficiency property holds. So that goes through, which is a nice, uh, a nice result to have. So if you use our algorithm, again, you fit a model, you take a particular vector of Xs, you plug them into the model, you get a forecast of 4%. You use our algorithm to compute the Shapley values, they'll sum to 4%. Uh, now, what we've described so far is, is a local measure, right? It's saying for, Instance XT and predictor P, what's the contribution of that predictor to the prediction, right? So it's a local measure. Well, we'd like a global measure of P's importance. And here we can compute a variable importance measure, right? So what do we do? Well, we just look at all instances that are in our training sample. For each instance, right, we can compute the Shapley value corresponding to P. We take each of those Shapley values, take the absolute value, and then average them. And that gives us a variable importance measure based on Shapley on the Shapley value. This is a popular metric for measuring variable importance. Now, this is straightforward to compute if there's only a single training sample, right? What do I do? Here's my total data sample. Here's my training sample. Maybe I hold this out as a test sample. And so just for every instance in my training sample, for predictor P, I compute the Shapley value, take the absolute value, average them. And voila, I have my variable importance measure for my training sample. That's typically what's done. That's what you'll see in a textbook often, okay? But what do we do in time series, right? In time series, you know, we typically estimate a, a sequence of models, right? We don't estimate a model one time. We estimate a model regularly. We regularly retrain, refit the model as additional data become available, right? So we just want to expand this. So now imagine we're going to have a set of training samples. And the set of training samples could be based on a rolling window or an expanding window and just collect the, the set of training samples in this cab W, okay? 
Uh, and we're interested in the importance of a predictor for the entire sequence of fitted models used to generate the forecasts. Right? And so what do we do? Well, we just talked about how you can take one training sample and compute the variable importance for predictor P. Well, just do this for each training sample that you have that you use to generate your sequence of out of sample forecasts and then take the average. And that gives you, that gives you our, I, our I Shapley VI measure. We could also talk about measuring the Shap Shapley value for your out of sample forecasts, right? So we take the X's that you plug into your fitted model generate uh, in the model was fitted using a particular window. We compute the Shapley value for a given predictor for that instance. They do this now for each out of sample forecast. Okay, that's painful. Each out of sample forecast, take the absolute value, and then you can compute what we call the out of sample Shapley value variable importance, the O Shapley VI. So then you're saying, you know, for my whole sequence of models, how important was a given predictor in generating the forecasts? Okay. Now, what do we really care about? Uh, and this is how we modify the algorithm. This is the main contribution to the paper. Again, we're interested in the importance of a, uh, actually, let me go one more. We're interested in the contribution of a predictor to forecasting accuracy. Okay, so what do we do? Well, it's, it's deceptively simple. Just when computing the Shapley value, instead of focusing in the value function on the, the prediction made by the model per se, f of f hat of xt, we're just going to wrap a loss function around that. We're going to take into account the realized value of the target as well as our prediction. But otherwise, we just use the basic logic of, Shapley, of a Shapley value, and we can compute for each out-of-sample observation for a given predictor P, we can compute a Shapley value associated with a loss function, okay? We can do this, again, jointly over the entire out of sample period, and that allows us to use the logic of Shapley values to exactly decompose, say, the RMSE for your model. So if your RMSE is, again, 5%, we'll be able to take the set of predictors you have, could be 5, 10, 100, and measure the prediction made by each of your predictor to that out-of-sample performance, okay? So in the interest of time, I'm going to jump. Again, there's a, an algorithm that does this. Uh, one of my co-authors, uh, Sander Schwenknebi, who I think is from Germany, uh, did a, a magnificent job of creating uh, a Python package called Anatomy, where you can implement all of this. So we do, we undertake an out of sample forecasting exercise for inflation. The usual stuff, Fred MD used some Michigan, uh, University of Michigan survey of consumers. Here's the initial in sample period. Here's our out of sample period. We use a rolling estimation window. So we have well over, I think, well over 120 predictors. We're going to use a number of different models principal component regression, linear ENET model. We have some nonlinear machine learning models and some ensemble forecasts. So here's the uh, benchmark AR. The RMSC, these are the RMSC ratios. Below one means we're outperforming the benchmark. So you can see we're doing quite well, especially at longer horizons for the nonlinear models. Don't, okay. Uh, and so what we do is for each of these different models, I'll do one example here. Let's take the uh, forecast based on the ENET, right? So we generated a sequence of inflation forecasts using a rolling window and a large number of predictors. 
uh, using, a, again, a linear ENAP model. We computed the I Shapley VI, the O Shapley VI, and our PBSV, our performance-based Shapley value. So the, 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 uh, the red line is the I Shapley. The black line is the O Shapley. They match up quite well. The green line is the PBSV. And so what we find is, in many cases, perhaps not surprisingly, the I Shapley VI matches up with the PBSV. So a predictor that's deemed important in generating forecasts according to the more standard in-sample Shapley value measure, right, matches up well with a variable that's important in generating an accurate forecast. However, even though our models perform well overall, we find some important discrepancies. For example, you can see this is negative one here. This means this is the predictor that contributed the most to detracting from out-of-sample forecasting accuracy. So according to the in-sample Shapley value, it's one of the 25 top predictors but it actually contributed the most to, again, detracting from forecasting accuracy. And it is the, uh, this happens to be industrial production for materials. So you can see when these green lines are, uh, what, facing south, and they have numbers like minus one, minus two, minus, right? That means these are predictors that are contributing the most to negative performance. Okay, but yet they're deemed important by the Shapley, the in-sample Shapley value. So the, warn, the a potential warning message is just because something looks important through the lens of the in-sample Shapley value, right, when you actually examine whether it, how it contributes to out-of-sample forecasting accuracy, it could contribute in a, in a in a helpful and a positive way, contributing more accuracy, but there's no guarantee. And even if your model does well overall, you can find some discrepancies. I consider that well done on my part. Okay. Thank you for your generosity. <laughs> okay, great. Thanks very much. Um, so thanks to the organizers for asking me to discuss this uh, very interesting paper. Um, well, I'll try to be quick uh, given the time that we have. Yeah, there we go. So just a one-page paper summary. Um, well, I, th I think David uh, well, mentioned that as well. There's a lot of interest in machine learning, and this conference has also uh, mentioned that. But a caveat, of course, is that, uh, well, yeah, it's subject to a black box criticism. And why I think it's particularly important that we talk about it at, uh, at this venue is that it, of course, limits the use of such kind of methods for policy analysis. Eh? You want to get a forecast, but you also want to motivate a forecast. What is driving a certain forecast? And that's exactly what this, uh, this paper is about. Uh, in short, what they do is they develop Shapley-based metrics for interpreting the models, and they have three of them. Two are, uh, uh, well, to have the importance of individual predictors for predicted target values, and that's in and out of sample. And a new one, uh, a PBSV metric, where you look the contribution of individual predicted for the loss in a sequence of a given model. I'll talk a little bit more about it on the next slide, because this is really the core of the paper. Um, but what's also in the paper is, is an empirical study of forecasting the inflation for the US. And what they find is, you, you, well, the, the, the indicators or the predictors that you get, um, they make some sense. It's oil, it, it, it's various components of CPI, but also, and I think that's also nice uh, uh, to see from the result, is that these measures, they do give some different kind of insights. So you do need a variety of these metrics. It's not one that, uh, that generates all the results that we have. Now, because it's so crucial for the paper, let me spend one slide on Shapley values, but I think it was uh, very well uh, explained. Uh, essentially, what you're dealing with is a certain model that we have over here, a linear model, a time series model, a predictive model, and we're predicting the future. Um, X is also dimension P, so they use the FRED MD data set, so that's, uh, well, something like 100 variables in there, so that's large. And we collect these indices of all these elements in X in this uh, set S, so that's the one over here. 
And what we do for the Shapley value, we look at it one predictor at a time. So we get the Shapley value five for the P predictor, P lowercase. The idea is very simple. What we're doing is we're going to compare the prediction of all possible sets of indices where P is included. So that's this first term. And we compare that to the prediction you would make if you have such a set where P is not included. Yeah. And you do that for all possible sets that you can compile and you have some appropriate weighting for that in place. So that's the whole idea of a Shapley value. Here it's already implemented with a prediction in mind. I'm a bit sloppy in notation, so that's why I, uh, well, I could fit it in one line instead of one slide, but, uh, but that's the whole idea of that. And you can change, of course, uh, well, what you want to evaluate for the Shapley value. So it's a very general kind of thing. Um, now that's the idea that dates back from 53 and what the paper does very cleverly and I think that's something that's really uh, to be applauded for is adjust it for a relevant setting for well more time series econometrics where what you have is uh, modern days a large number of predictors uh, you can imagine you have a lot of those sets if you already have p of these variables so to have a clever sampling algorithm for that we have samples that keep on extending you make a forecast one time out, you get a new observation, you make a new forecast. And not only that, in that you have re-estimation every time. So this is all taken care of in the paper, and you get this E.O. Uh, e Shapley. And you can also consider, rather than the prediction that you get, you can also look at, uh, well, may maybe the loss function that you have in mind. And that's this PBSV measure that they do. Now, I have a few comments for the paper. I've summarized them in uh, three categories. The first one deals with uh, the empirical findings. I hope this figure is well uh, readable. I think this is the same figure that you uh, that you also showed uh, in, the, in the presentation. So uh, it essentially ranks all these explanatory variables from most important to least important. The first thing I noticed when I looked at this, uh, this figure in the paper, it's for one, three, six, and I think 12 months out, is that there seems to be some instability in what, uh, what seems to be important for at least one of the dimensions. So if you look at the one month ahead forecast, you can see here PCE, PI, that's the least important. If you look at the six month out forecast, it's suddenly the second most important. So there seems to be quite a big kind of, uh, kind of jump. I think it would be interesting to, uh, to touch upon that. Also, I was thinking, I've, I've played myself with this FredMD data set in my own research, and there's a lot of very similar series in there. If you look at the yields, there's six different yields in there, and we know they're highly correlated. For inflation, there's a lot of similar kind of measures uh, in there. So I was thinking, what do I expect to get from this Shapley value? Do I expect to get some grouping that all of these variables are equally important? Oh, I didn't click a button, so let me go back. That they're equally important, or do we actually expect the contrary? If we have six yields, let me take the yield as example, I take out one yield, I expect that to not make that big of a difference. So you would have it less important as Shapley. But then again, is that fair? I mean, if there's a lot of variables in this thread MD data set, that's likely a sign that this is an important kind of variable. So I think this is a consideration that I think is worth spending some time on. Uh, what can we actually expect in such kind of data set? Now then the empirical application, uh, um, um, well, some choices are made relatively early on in the paper. I'm interested uh, about the robustness. So rather than predict uh, well, steps ahead, like age periods ahead, it's the average of the age periods ahead. Um, predictors are included and also, uh, well, not lags of predictors, but a moving average, a three month moving average of the predictor. So I'm curious, why don't you just include the previous two uh, periods as well? I know it will be bigger, but then you can let the model decide what you need, for example. And there's some selections uh, in there. So that's just, uh, I would say, maybe somewhat minor kind of points. Another point is the benchmark. The benchmark uses the ARK kind of model. We've seen in this figure that I've just showed, it's always very important. So that is really an important feature that you're uh, picking up. But I personally would also be interested in looking at smaller models. We've already heard the UCSV model uh, a few times. You can think of uh, a limited number of macro variables. Also taking into account a little bit that uh, the, the, the improvement that you get for the short horizon, uh, at least, well, I, I, I would label it somewhat modest, it's 7%. It grows very rapidly, it goes to 20% uh, uh, if you look at 12 periods ahead. But I, uh, well, I supervise a lot of master thesis on these machine learning methods and then 7% is rare. Usually you see something in the vicinity of 30, 40%, the kind of outperformance. Uh, so perhaps that has something to do with the benchmark. Maybe the benchmark is already very good. So in, 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 yeah, I would like to see some robustness there as well as some alternative choices. 
And then another point that I will get back to uh, uh, perhaps at a final kind of slide is that you also include a more traditional kind of econometric model, the PCA, or you call it the PCR, a principal component regression. So I'm curious, for these regression coefficients, if you would look at significance, would we make the same kind of conclusions as we would make based on the Shapley kind of, uh, kind of values? Final, uh, I also have a paper where I use Shapley uh, values. Uh, I do that for finding out the driving factors of sovereign credit rating, and I thought maybe it's helpful to share the kind of feedback I've been getting from the referees there. So uh, it's free riding, maybe it's even lazy, but I do think it, uh, it can, uh, can offer some value. And some of the comments I've received is, uh, what would happen if you omit some variables? So you found something is not important. What if we take that out? What would happen in that particular case? Um, can you maybe extend the paper with more models. I think that's a risk if you work in a machine learning literature. It's a very fast moving kind of literature. By the time the ink is dry, there's a new method and you can go back to the drawing board already. Um, ensembles were mentioned in our case, you have them and I do think you have a very nice selection of methods uh, already. Um, panel nature, uh, we were asked to take the panel nature into account. We didn't, we just did a, a fairly basic kind of analysis. You do, so I think you really make a big step in the literature for, uh, for doing this, for really taking that into account in these kind of metrics. There we go. Um, some of these, these, these Python packages, they, they already spit out some sort of variable importance kind of metric. So I think this relates a little bit, little bit to the audience you have in mind. That's one of my final comments. But yeah, you will probably be challenged to compare to those kind of uh, uh, off the shelf kind of techniques as well. And a final thing, and that's something that I alluded to as well in, uh, in some of my previous comments, is to, uh, to have a closer comparison of your findings with the ex existing literature. So how does it line up with what other people have found in this uh, kind of setting? So the final point is then indeed what kind of audience. I think the paper right now is very much in between of a machine learning and an econometric kind of paper, and that's fine. I think that's where uh, a lot of papers are nowadays. I was tempted because you do include uh, at least the principal component regression and you have a very nice paragraph where you look at the linear model to see if you could take that a little bit further and to see what, well, what would be econometric implications or what can we learn econometrically about uh, what you have. Um, hard to say in machine learning, but perhaps in the linear case you could do it. What about a simulation study? If we simulate data from a certain data generating process, we make variables important, not so important. Maybe we can figure out how strong is the Shapley, uh, uh, the information that we extract from the Shapley values. How strong is that information actually? And perhaps you could even look at some sort of statistics for the linear case and see if there's some connection between significance and between these, uh, these Shapley values. And that's it to conclude. I think it's a very nice paper. It opens the black box, very cleverly done, adapting it to the time series setting, and I uh, recommend you to read the paper. Okay. Questions from the floor? Hi, um, Karin Kieber from the Austrian Central Bank. Um, great talk, thanks. Oh, okay. um, I have actually two questions. So the first one is whether you think or it, it might be that it's a bit distracting to just take the mean, because what I was thinking is if you take the mean across all the Shapley values, across the holdout and across I, maybe the rolling window when I got that right, that it might be that, for example, in industrial production, it is a good predictor, I don't know, in the 2000s, but then we had the coronavirus and then the observations get crazy and now it's not a good predictor. Um, but then it's kind of, we would like to know whether it was one before the, the pandemic, maybe. And the second question is um, whether uh, we could even use your tool as a kind of model selection or variable selection tool, because you showed that when the values are negative, I hope I got that right, um, that they are disturbing, kind of. So would it be better than just to kick them out? Um, yeah, thank you. Hi, so we were talking before, so I, I go in line with some of the questions and jump at this from this view. Um, so one, one thing that uh, that when I try to think about it is like the ensemble is like the residuals, no? When you construct your model, your tree, you 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 fit the tree based on some errors and some, you know, and some loss function in this case. And so that will give you the ensemble sharply values. 
while in the your idea also in the out of sample Shapley values you on top put the errors that is the what we think in linear models about the out of sample errors which you know we always try to test our models with the out of sample errors better than the in sample errors of course because this is the fit okay so my question would be is there maybe it's in the selection in line with the goals, can we learn from the out of sample errors, from the out of sample Shapley values, what not to use in the in sample or in the construction of the tree? Because in the tree, we don't use that. We just use the in sample errors. So. Uh, thanks, thanks for the very nice presentation. I really enjoyed it. I have uh, just a couple of questions. One is related to the discussion point. Would it be possible to exclude groups of predictors that perhaps are correlated? Because clearly in the Fred MD, it gives you, you know, some is fiscal, some is interest rates, some is prices. So maybe you can get over the comment on, on correlation. And then uh, related to the previous question, how expensive it is if you have to track over time? The Shapley values, maybe you have in the paper. I'm sorry if it's a stupid question, but can you eventually look at each time t how the ranking changes, if changes at all? Uh, thanks, thanks. Thank you also for the interesting talk. Um, I, I just like to know whether the, the Shapley value is in, is in the end a distance measure. Can you also associate with this distance measure some statistical? Um, distribution, so we can basically formally test whether they are important or not. I think that will really complete the whole thing. Thank you. Yep. Um, thanks. So Ignacio from the from the ECB, and I wanted to collect your thoughts on on using these this method for for variable selection. So more or less on on this line, because if if you use if well. If you include one one of the variables um, that, according to your model, is not um, actually um, not contributes to reduce the error, so uh, increases the error. Um, if you include that uh, variable on your on your random forest, given that the random forest in the end is going, you're going to estimate it uh, in order to reduce uh, the error or to minimize the error. Um, that variable is not going to enter in in your tree as a as a potential one for in the splits. So, what's 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 your thought on these? Do you think that that makes a difference, like using your uh, approach to to other approaches, or not at all? Like reducing the variable. Okay, should I go ahead? Okay. Okay. Uh, well, thank you so much, especially to the. This to discuss them, but it is, well, these were excellent questions. So I'm just going to kind of go down my list and cover your uh, cover your uh, point, some of your points, and, and address the questions as well. Uh, so one thing I, I should mention, uh, we uh, this might be helpful. Uh, you know, we have those those plots, uh, but we're actually developing uh, what we're calling. Uh, let me see if I can remember the name. Uh, a model accordance score, an MAS. So we're going to provide you with just a single measure between zero and one of how well the in-sample Shapley valuable value valuable in-sample Shapley variable importance uh, corresponds to the PBSV. So we think that'll be uh, you know, quite helpful. Uh, okay, so. Yeah, you know, instability of the results, especially over the different horizons. Uh, yeah, you know, there's some commonality, but there are certainly are some differences. I think we can tell some reasonable stories for some variables, uh, just that may, uh, if you think about the nature of inflation and, you know, sticky prices. But yes, it, it seems somewhat idiosyncratic to me. So... Uh, I don't know. It must perhaps this is uh, somehow indicative of noise in the data that we inevitably encounter when we have to generate forecasts. But uh, that's something we're going to need to think about some more. Uh, exactly how to interpret that. Uh, but you make an excellent point. Uh, so I think with 
Danielle, and, and you mentioned about grouping. You can absolutely do this. Actually, we have a, uh, we're doing a, a, a sort of a finance related spinoff on this and we have, you know, we're into the literature on firm characteristics and we have uh, just a tremendous number of firm characteristics and uh, it becomes very costly to compute these Shapley values because we're just the, exactly what we're doing and we actually do group variables there. So you could certainly do everything we have here and you just group them. And so everything would still go through. If you take your groups and they're exhaustive and non-overlapping, if you add the PBSV score, uh, you would get the prediction. And uh, uh, actually, PBS, you would get the out-of-sample loss. So absolutely, I think grouping is a uh, is an excellent idea and maybe will aid in interpretation and maybe help to avoid some of those weird results that we saw. Um, let me, uh, let's see, let me move to, uh, yeah, so a number of people, I think in various and sundry ways have <laughs> said, well, can we, what can you do with this information, right? So this of course is ex post, right? So I'm saying, you know, you've generated this sequence of forecasts and then after the fact I can, we can use the metric and say, oh, these predictors, you know, they really help. They really improve the accuracy of your forecast. But these other predictors are uh, not so much, right? They detracted from accuracy. So we are thinking about you know, trying to come up with a, a way, I mean, just I guess I'll tell, just don't tell anybody else, I'll just tell the people in the room the plan. Uh, so you can imagine having like a holdout out of sample period, right? So you could, for that holdout out of sample period, you could compute the PBSVs and then say, okay, the ones that perform poorly, maybe you drop them. So you don't include them when you build your next random forest. And you can kind of do this over time. Now it's a little tricky, right? Maybe I want to reintroduce them after a while. So I think one would have to do a good bit of experimentation, but I think there is some scope for using this, not just to say after the fact, you know, what caused things to go south for you, but to try to actually improve out of sample forecasts. Uh, I think, uh, a number of people, again, I, maybe Karen and Daniel, uh, asked about subsample analysis. Absolutely. Actually, there's a, if I do say so myself, a, a nice figure in the paper where we have non overlapping 12 month periods, and we say for these periods, which predictor uh, was the most important, which predictor contributed the in a positive sense to out of sample forecasting accuracy during that 12 month period and which can which uh, most attracted uh you can and you can literally go down to one observation you could do it month by month day by day if you want and i think that can be we find some interesting patterns and we actually talk about them in the paper uh so uh statistical test <laughs> yeah thought about that from the beginning yeah not sure what one would do i mean we can scratch our heads about trying to make some core set of assumptions just to get started uh i'm certainly open to hearing ideas one could you can imagine doing some sort of you know maybe in a crude way, some sort of bootstrap or simulations, but the problem is it gets quite computationally costly to calculate these things. So I think, of, I mean, maybe if I had, you know, one heck of a cluster, I could pull it off, but it would be, it would be challenging. Um, I don't know if I'm missing anything. I, I appreciate PCR, like, uh, you know, looking at the significance of predictors in the PCR and then comparing them to the, what's happening in terms of the, the PBS fees on an out of sample basis, this could be, this could be interesting as well. Um, I think I've covered most of the questions. If, if, if you have uh, others, you know, 
feel free to uh, <laughs> approach me. So I'm not leaving till tomorrow. So, and my social calendar is wide open tonight. So thanks again. Okay, thank you.